Shabbos Daf Nun Gimel is a long daf, which we will begin with the Mishnah at the end of Daf Nun Bez, which lists a number of different devices and animals are not allowed to carry, and some that they are allowed to carry. Uh, halfway through the daf, we'll see a brisa that adds to the list, and most of the Gemara will be describing the different devices and which ones they're allowed to carry. Along the way, we'll have a discussion between Rav and Shmuel and some other Tanaim about putting certain devices on animals, even when it's not a question of carrying, it's a question of too much exertion for a person to put them on. Um, the Gemara will discuss which devices you're allowed to and which you aren't, and also what the purpose of the different devices that animals are not allowed to carry are. Along the way, we'll have a story or two, and then we will get to defining some of the words of the Mishnah at the end of the We begin with the Mishnah at the bottom of Daf Nun Beis Amid Beis. The Mishnah is discussing various animals and devices which they may walk into the public domain wearing on Shabbos and are not considered carrying. In previous Mishnahs, we discussed devices used to control the animals. Here we're discussing devices with other purposes. And we're going to discuss a donkey, a ram, a ewe, and a goat. So first of all, the donkeys are allowed to wear a blanket. The donkeys are always cold, even during the summer, they're allowed to wear a blanket. It serves the animal, and therefore it's not cold carrying, it's considered clothing. The general rule here will be anything which is considered serving is permitted because it's considered wearing and not carrying. Now what about rams? Those are male sheep. So they're allowed to go out into the public domain when they are levuvin. Um, and female sheep used may go when they are they are shchuzois, kvulois, or kvunois. Now these four words, levuvim, shchuzois, kvulois, kvunois, refer to various manner of tying them up. And the Gemara will explain what they all are. Now as far as the goats, so the issue with the goats was tying their udders to stop them from lactating, from uh, producing milk, or putting... A, a, a bag hanging from the udder in order to catch milk that drips. These are two things you may attach to the udders of a goat. So the Gemara says as follows. Uh, as far as tying the udders to stop them from being milked, so everybody, the Tanakama and Rabbi Yehuda, agree that that's permitted. But as far as putting a pouch on to catch the dripping milk, that the Tanakama says is permitted. And Rabbi Huda says that's forbidden for a different reason, not because he's not wearing it, but because it was loose and it could fall off, and then the shepherd would end up holding it and possibly carrying it when he isn't allowed to carry it. Now, these are the primary opinions here. Now the Gemara says that Rabbi Yaisi says that all these cases are forbidden. You're not allowed to wear any of this stuff. The animal is not allowed to accept, with one exception, the ewe, the female sheep, is allowed is allowed to go out into the public domain, kivunos. Kivunos. We don't know what kivunos is yet. The Gemara will explain what all these things are. The Gemara begins by discussing the blanket that the donkey wears. The Gemara says, the Shmuel says that the blanket has to be tied on before Shabbos. It's not enough that it's tied on on Shabbos before the donkey goes out into the public domain. It's got to be tied before Shabbos. And um, there's a machlok to show them what the reason is. It could be because if you tie it on Shabbos, you may end up leaning against the animal, which would be uh, forbidden for a different reason. Okay, now, the Gemara now brings a couple of Mishnahis and a, a Mishnah and a Brisa to support Shmuel's statement. Uh, Rav Nachman says, I'll prove that Shmuel is right. It has to be tied on before Shabbos because they have a Mishnah that says that um, you're only allowed to take the donkey out if the blanket is tied. Now, when you say that it's tied, it can't mean that it's just tied, because for sure it has to be tied. Because if it's not tied, it'll slide right off. Anything that slides off, we know, is forbidden to wear in the public domain, because you're going to end up carrying it. So when it says it's tied, it must mean that it was tied before Shabbos. That's what the Mishnah means. And um, the Gemara accepts. The Gemara calls it Bryce. It also supports Shmuel's statement that the Blanket has to be tied on before Shabbos. The Bryce says explicitly, a donkey is only allowed to go out on Shabbos with a blanket on if it was tied before Shabbos. Then the Bryce says, and the is about a saddle. Uh, according to the Tanakamba, the saddle is forbidden to be worn by the donkey, even if it was tied before Shabbos. According to Hashem Ben Gamliel, it's permitted. The reason for this, Machlokah says that the saddle doesn't do anything for the donkey. The saddle is used for a rider to ride on. You're not allowed to ride a donkey on Shabbos, and... The donkey is also not allowed to carry you or the saddle. Since it's not doing anything for the donkey, it's carrying. 
Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel says, no, it's permitted because it also warms the donkey a, a little bit. Okay. Now, Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel says that if you're going to have a saddle on the donkey, it has to be tied before Shabbos, like we said about the blanket. And you can't tie the anchors. The saddle had a strap that went around the neck of the donkey to make sure that it didn't slip too far backwards and had a strap that went around the tail to make sure that it didn't slip too far forward. So you can't do those two straps because that looks like you're planning on loading the donkey. And that's the end of the brisa that supports Shmuel. Now the Gemara moves on to a different halacha. Gemara now enters into a discussion as to which items you're allowed to put on a donkey on Shabbos. Now... We're not talking here about carrying, because the donkey is going to stay inside your private domain. And we're not talking about leaning on the donkey on Shabbos, because you're not going to tie anything, and you only come to lean on it when you tie on it. The question is, what are you allowed to put on the donkey? The potential issue is that it's tircha yisera, it's extra exertion. You're working hard to, to, to place something on the back of the donkey on Shabbos, there's no reason for it. And therefore, it's forbidden. The only case in which it would be permitted is if the donkey stands to gain significantly from it. Either you are saving it from discomfort or you're creating a benefit for it. If you're doing something for the donkey, then we allow you to exert yourself on Shabbos. Now, there are four issues to be discussed here. One of them is the saddle blanket, which we've been discussing. The saddle blanket provides warmth for the donkey. That is a tremendous benefit for it. The Gemara will say that everybody agrees you're allowed to put on, except for um, Rav Asi Bar Noson, who asked Rav Chiyah Barashi, didn't understand why should he be allowed to do that. He felt that he shouldn't be allowed to do it. But everybody else, the Gemara will say Rav Shmuel and Rav Yechanan and Rav Talmud, Rav Asi Bar Noson, uh, sorry, Rav Chiyah Bar. Rav Ashi, they all agree that you're allowed to put the blanket on the donkey on Shabbos in order to save it from being a cold. Now, the next issue is a feed bag. Now, a feed bag, you're not saving the donkey from discomfort. The feed bag was hung around the animal's neck so that it could eat from it without having to lean to stretch its head all the way to the floor. So, there's already a machlex between Rav and Shmuel. Uh, and Rav's Talmidim agree with him. Shmuel says that it's forbidden. You're not really doing anything for the animal. It could eat just fine without the bag. So it's an extra exertion. Rav says, no, you're giving the animal pleasure. You're allowing it to eat. It's a wonderful thing. You are making it easier for the animal to eat. Therefore, it's permitted to do it on Shabbos also. It's not extra exertion. Rav is Talmud. Rav Chia uh, Barashi and Rav Zaira quotes him agree with Rav here. So Rav says that this is permitted. Umar has a bit of an incident over here where Rabbi Zera went f- from Babylonia to Eretz so He saw Rabbi Yaman Bar Yefa saying the name of Rabbi Yechon. You're allowed to put on a uh, blanket on a, a, a donkey and Rabbi Zera said, you're right, that's what Ayuch said. Umar says, Ayach is Shmuel. Umar wants to know, but why did he quote Shmuel? Rav also says, you're allowed to put the blanket on. Everybody says, you're allowed to put the blanket on. So Umar says, no, what Rav really heard him say was, you're allowed to put a blanket, but you're not allowed to put a feed bag. So that's only Shmuel. Either way, Rav and Shmuel agree you're allowed to put the blanket on because you save the donkey from being cold. The machlog is between them whether or not you're allowed to put the feed bag on because you're just allowing it to eat. The question is the saddle. So there's a brace that says, you're not allowed to take a saddle off the donkey on chops. What you should do is you should just walk back and forth until it falls off. So why, why is it also to take the saddle off? And what does it tell us about putting the saddle on? So Gemara gives two explanations here. Um, the first one, the Gemara gives without a name, is that the saddle could fall off by itself. Since it could fall off by itself, there's no justification for you to exert yourself to take it off. Uh, you're not really helping the animal that much because it could fall off on its own. Okay. So, based on that, what would be the halacha to put the saddle on? Well, what does the animal gain from placing the saddle on? It provides a little bit of warmth. Okay, so, according to this, it could be that Rav and will agree that you're allowed to put the saddle on because they would both want warmth. Um, now, that's the Gemara's first approach as to why it's forbidden to take the saddle off because it could fall off on its own, putting the saddle on, that obviously it can't fall on on its own, and you'd be allowed to put it on 
to give the animal warmth. Now, Rav Papa gives a different shot here. Why the Bryce says you're not allowed to take the saddle off? He says, because taking the saddle off, what does that do for the donkey? It just lets it cool off a little. A donkey is generally a cool animal. It does not need to chill out. So you're not doing anything for him by t- taking it off. However, to put the the saddle on, so that could be that it is permitted because it gives it some warmth. Uh, Rashi seems to say that it's not permitted at all, according to Rav Papa, because he holds that it doesn't do anything for it. Now, the Gemara says that this Mandi Omar here, who asked the question of Asi Bar Noson, wanted to learn from the Brisa that it's also forbidden to uh, put the blanket on. And the Gemara's conclusion is that it's not. You can't learn from the Brisa that says you're not allowed to take a saddle off, that you're not allowed to put a saddle on. That's not necessarily true. Putting a saddle on does provide benefit for the animal, and it can't fall off on its own. It can't fall on on its own. And the blanket, certainly you can't learn from that because the blanket provides significant advantage to the animal because it keeps it warm. Gemara now asks a kasha on Shmuel from a long brysa, which we're about to quote. Shmuel had held that you're allowed to put a blanket on the donkey to alleviate the suffering of being cold, but you're not allowed to hang the feed bag around its neck because that just makes it easier for it to eat and it's too much exertion to put that on. The brysa has a long list of things that an animal is not allowed to wear in the public domain. One of the things on the list is a feed bag. Neymar will say, well, it's only in the public domain that's not allowed to wear the feed bag, which seems to indicate that in the private domain, where there's no question of carrying, you are allowed to put the feed bag on. That is against Shmuel, says you're not allowed to put the feed bag on. So let's see the Brysa at length. The vast majority of the Brysa lists things that animals may not wear out on the street on Shabbos. The reason for most of them is that they are carrying because they don't serve the body of the animal. They serve some other function, therefore they're carrying. Some of them, the issue is that they may fall off, and the owner will end up carrying it. And then at the end of the price, they have a couple of things animals are allowed to wear. So let's see the list. First of all, a horse is not allowed to wear a foxtail or a red ribbon between its eyes. Those were meant to ward off Ayn Hara. Um, a zav, that's actually a person, is not allowed to go out into the public domain wearing the pouch. A zav would uh, have emissions from his male organ and he needed to know when and where because it made a difference to his halacha. So the pouch was there to collect them and catch them, but that's not serving the body. That's just serving another purpose and therefore he couldn't wear that. That's uh, carrying. The goat is not allowed to wear a pouch over the udders. Either it's carrying or it may fall off. A cow shouldn't wear a muzzle. Um, That's not serving the cow. It's not helping the cow, so it's carrying. Colts, young horses, are not allowed to go out into the street with feed bags. This is what our proof is going to be from. They're not allowed to travel out with feed bags, but you're allowed to put the feed bags on them. And it's not a question of extra exertion. Um, Animals should not wear a shoe on its foot. There, The issue is that it's going to fall off. A horseshoe is not a problem. Horseshoes don't fall off, usually. An animal is not allowed to wear a kimea, an amulet, which is supposed to contain psukim, which will cure it from a disease. Uh, humans are allowed to wear those amulets if they're proven effective, but animals are not. The Gemara, the Bryce says, this is one way in which a uh, animal has stricter halachos than a human. Now we have a few things an animal is allowed to wear. It's allowed to wear a, a, a bandage on a wound that serves the body. It's allowed to wear a fracture. It's allowed to wear a splint for a broken limb. That's just a piece of wood that's wrapped around the limb. It's allowed to have a placenta hanging out of it. Um, That's part of the body. And the bell that animal wears around its neck, it's allowed to wear that in the street, but you have to block up the bell so it shouldn't ring because it's forbidden to ring a bell on Shabbos. Okay, so now the Gemara says, like we said, that this shows that Shmuel is not correct because it says that it's only a problem to wear a feed bag in the street, but inside the private domain is permitted. So the Gemara answer is that this is talking about young occults. And for them, the question of wearing a feed bag is not just about extra pleasure for the animal. It's not just about making it easy for him to eat. It's very difficult for a young cult to reach food. It has a very short neck and very long legs. And it's hard for them to reach the food, and that's why this is permitted. The Bigamar proves this by saying that the feedback here is the same as the Kamea, the amulet. Both of them are to relieve suffering, and that's why they're put together in the Brysa. The Gemara now discusses the halacha mentioned in the Brysa that an, am- 
then an animal is not allowed to carry in the street a, a kamea, a, a healing amulet, which is proven effective. So the one says, why should it be different than a person? A person is allowed to carry an amulet if it's proven effective. So the says, no, because a person is also not allowed to carry an amulet which is not effective. Here it's referring to an amulet which is not effective. The one says, what do you mean? It, it says explicitly in the Brisa, it's not allowed to carry an amulet even if it's proven effective. The Gemara says it's referring to the following thing. It's referring to an amulet which is effective for people. It's not effective for animals. It's coming to tell you that just because an amulet is effective for a person and a person can carry it does not mean that it's effective for animals and then an animal can carry it. Now, this is referring to there are many rules as to how you establish a person's expertise in writing an amulet. The Gemara means to say that a person who is an expert at writing amulets, which means that he can write one for any type of person and any type of disease, doesn't mean he can write one for an animal. So the Gemara wants to know why not. So the Gemara says because animals are different than people. People, in a sense, are easier to write amulets for. People have a mazel. They have a, uh, a shmira. They have a they have an angel in Shamayim that watches over them. And therefore, it's easier to tap into their source of healing spiritually. Animals don't have that, and therefore it's much harder to write an amulet for them. Just because somebody can write an amulet for a person doesn't mean he can write one for an animal. So, Gmar says, so then if that's true, so then why does the Bryce say that this law is stricter for animals than for people? It's not stricter. It's the same. Both animals and people cannot carry an amulet, which is not proven effective. All it means to say is that just because it's effective for a person doesn't mean it's effective for an animal. doesn't mean that the law is any stricter. So Gemara says, you're right. That line that this is stricter for an animal than a person was not referring to amulets. It was talking about shoes. The Bryce said that an animal is not allowed to wear a shoe because it might fall off. A person is allowed to wear a shoe. We don't have to be afraid that a person's shoe is going to fall off. The Gemara has a few questions on Rav and Shmuel Shita that you're allowed to perform activities for an animal which will alleviate its suffering, even though it would be a tircha, it would be an exertion for the person who is performing it. You're allowed to do it on Shabbos. So the Gemara has two questions. One, there's a bias that says you're allowed to rub oil on a sore and scrape off a scab of a person, but not from an animal. So why not? You're treating the wound, which is festering. You're saving the animal from pain. Versus we're not talking about an open wound. We're talking about a healed wound. And this is just giving pleasure to the animal. Okay, then the Gemara asks, what about a uh, case of somebody or an animal who suffers from something called Ochza Hadam, which means the blood got seized. Rashi identifies it as a condition called Alpandura. So... The solution to that is to stand in cold water to cool him off. So the Bryce says that a person's uh, allowed to do it, but an animal's not. So the says, why not? The animal is a suffering, you should be allowed to. So the Gemara answers, Ul answers, this is not because of uh, exertion here. The issue here is that it's a medicinal activity, and medicinal activities are forbidden me to bunny, and not to do anything which is a medical treatment, unless, of course, it's a situation of extreme sickness, but you now do anything medicinal because you may end up preparing an actual medicine and grinding powders to do that. So the Gemara says, well, that, that applies to a person also. How come the person's allowed to stand in the cold water? So Gemara says, for a person, it's not necessarily medicinal. Healthy people also go into cool water to cool off. Gemara says, so I, healthy animals also do? Gemara says, yeah, healthy animals do, but people don't put their animals in cold water to cool them off. So if you're putting an animal in cool water, that's not the kind of thing you do for a healthy animal. It's only for sick animals, and therefore it's medicinal. You're not allowed to do that on Shabbos. So I think more says, is it really true that the whole halacha of not being allowed to do medicinal activities applies to animals? Don't we have a rule that the, all these gzairas that we make don't apply in a situation where you may lose money? Where you're not allowed to do A because it may come to do B. Those don't apply in a case of loss. What's the loss? Because if the animal will become injured or, or die, you'll lose the value. Um, how do we prove that we don't make such gazeras if they'll be lost? So the Gemara is a case of an animal that's standing outside the Tchum. So you're not allowed to go to it. But you're allowed to call it so that it should come back into your farm, into your Tchum. So why don't we say there's a gazera there that you may end up going to it? We don't say that because 
it's a case of loss. So therefore, this medicinal issue should also not be a problem because it's a case of loss. So the answer is no. We do say Xerah is uh, even in a case of loss of an animal. In the case of the Tchum there was where the animal is outside of its own Tchum. The animal was the responsibility of somebody to watch for the owner. And it's therefore limited to that person's Tchum. And it's outside of that. But it's within the owner's Tchum. So there's no concern that the owner may go to it. Because even if he does, he's not outside the Tchum. However, he's not allowed to bring the animal in physically. Because it's causing the animal to walk outside of its Tchum. But he is allowed to call it and have it leave its Tchum to go into his land that is not forbidden. The Gemara now says that this is actually a Machogis Tanoim. We have a Baisa that says if an animal ate too much Karshinim, too many lentils, and it got a stomach cramp as a result. So as a Machogis, are you allowed to run it around the yard in order to loosen it up? The Tanakhama says no, and Ravashi says yes, and Rav says the Allah is like Ravashi. Okay, now the Gemara goes back to the Brisa. The Brisa had said that a goat is not allowed to go out into the public domain with the pouch over their udders. Gemara asks that there's a Brisa that says that the the goats are allowed to. So the Gemara asks, it's a contradiction. So the Gemara offers three answers. Review this says one is talking about where the pouch is securely attached and therefore it's not going to fall off. And one is talking about where it's loose and it might fall off and the owner may end up carrying it. So Rabbi Yosef said, what are you talking about? Our Mishnah had three opinions. They had Rabbi Yosef who said that all pouches are forbidden. You had the Tanakama who said they're all permitted. And we had Rabbi Yehuda who said that it's permitted to stop the goat from having milk but not to catch the milk. So what's the problem? You have two Bryce's that say opposite r- 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 rulings. The one which says that it is permitted, that's, Rabbi, that's the Tanakhama of our one. And the one that says that it's forbidden, that's Rabbi Yaisi who says that it's also. What's the problem? Or Rabbi Yaisi says the third answer. They're both Rabbi Huda, and one is talking about the pouch that's to dry up the milk, and one is talking about the pouch which is to collect the milk that drips. Either way, there's no issue. Now, once on the subject, in records of Bryce that says that there were once very interesting udders on some goats from the city of Antioch. Their udders were so big that they were scratched by thorns. And that would be another reason you could put a pouch on them, apparently, to protect them from thorns. Now, the Gemara quotes more. An, a similar interesting story about an udder, but this is a human udder. The Gemara says that there was a man whose wife died, and uh, he had a child who was still nursing, but didn't have any money to hire a woman to feed him. So he didn't know what to do. So a miracle happened for him, and he was able to feed him from his own chest. So Gemara says uh, a few different reactions from Amaram to this uh, incident. Rav Yosef said this man must be very great. He had a miracle. Abayah said, no, this man is very not great because he had to have miracles happen to him in order to feed his, his himself and his children. That's If you have a miracle happen to you, that's not good. It means you lose your schayin al Rav Yehuda said, ah, look how hard it is to provide a person's food because you had to change, you had to do miracles in order to provide food for a person. Rav Nachman said, you can see that in other ways. Miracles happen all the time. Miracles to save a person's life happen all the time, but you very rarely do you see a miracle where food was suddenly created. That's that's a rare event. So you see that uh, the rules of providing food in the natural order are very strict. The Gemara here adds another story. The Gemara says it was a brisa that says that there was a woman who was missing a hand, and she got married. Her husband didn't know that she was missing hand. As a matter of fact, he didn't even realize it until the day she died. So Gemara has different reactions here. Rav says, look how tsenua, look how modest she was, that he didn't even see her hand. So he didn't see that she had a hand missing. And Gemara says, however, Rav Chia wasn't so impressed. Rav Chia said, well, that's because she wanted to hide her deformity. But look how modest he was, that he didn't even look to see that she was hiding her hand. Okay, now Gemara goes back to our Mishnah, which used a number of terms regarding... Um, the restraint for animals. One of the things it said is that rams, male sheep, are not allowed to go out on the street when they are levuvin. So what does that mean? So levuvin says it means tied together in pairs, which is derived from the 
pasuk that says, Libavtini achaisi kala. You've captured my heart, my sister, my kala. So Libavtini from the word heart means two hearts, so tied together, two rams tied together is called Levuvin. And why is a second explanation of Levuvin? Levuvin refers to a leather shield that is strapped on the chest over the heart, lave, levuvin from the word lave, heart, of the rams to protect them from wolves. The so says, why would only male sheep wear that? The says, because the males are attacked by wolves because they go at the head of the flock, so the first one that the wolf meets. The so Gemara says, the wolf doesn't come to the front of the flock, he goes to the back of the flock just as often. Mar says, okay, so the wolves, the male sheep are attacked because they're the fattest. So the says, first of all, they're fat female sheep. Second of all, the wolf comes with the flock. He doesn't know what's doing on the other side of the flock. If there's a skinny one in the back, he'll eat that one. So Mar says, no, the male sheep walk with their noses in the air, looking from side to side, and therefore the wolves think that they're about to get attacked by them. That's why they attack them first. Mara has a third explanation of the word levuvin. The Gemara says it's from the word levuv, meaning close, but it means the opposite of close. It's a piece of leather that is tied under the ram's male organs in order to prevent them from mounting the females. Now, um, what's the reason for that? When the females are uh, giving milk, the farmer doesn't want them to conceive because then they'll stop giving milk. So the verse says, um, and you could tell that this is what the word levuvin means because about female sheep it says that they shouldn't be shechuzos, which means that their tails are tied up in order to have the males mount them. Um, so the two are opposites. Levuvin is something put on the males to keep them from this activity, and shechuzos is something put on the females to encourage this activity. So the Gemara says, how do you know that shechuzos means that they're exposed like that? So the Gemara says, from a pasuk in Mishlei, which has Vahine Isha Lekrasa, a woman comes to meet him, and she is shechuzon on a slave, exposed like a prostitute, with a surrounded heart, the phrase shizona is related to shechuza, which means exposed.